Welcome to the Wanderers History Podcast and to a new episode which looks at what could have been one of the most ambitious projects of cinema, particularly historical cinema, and that would be Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon movie or biopic. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you to please hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already to make sure you never miss any new material from the podcast. Before we begin, I would like to give a short introduction to what the cinematic landscape looks today in order to contextualize the inability of a monumental movie or movies about Napoleon, such was Kubrick's project, to take shape and be released. It will be an episode in a few parts, which I hope you'll enjoy. When it comes to the cinematic landscape of nowadays, one focused on huge budgets, franchises, and billion-dollar profits, it is rather hard to think of historical movies, dramatized or fictionalized, that fit the profile. Cinematic masterpieces such as Silence, a long-time passion project of Martin Scorsese focused on Shushaku's Endo's novel that tells the story of two Portuguese Jesuit priests sailing to Japan in the 17th century and witnessing the brutal rejection and decimation of a Christian Japanese minority by Imperial Japanese forces. While it was a dramatization of historical events, it is still an unrecognized masterpiece that which I thoroughly enjoyed. It was a 2016 post-Christmas release in the UK, where half of the cinema viewers in the same theater left halfway through the movie, which was 2 hours and 49 minutes. With a reported budget of approximately $40 million, it only made $23.7 million worldwide, according to a box office mojo.com report. The audience reception did not come close to reflecting the craftsmanship, the very com- complex themes of betrayal and redemption, not to mention the cinematic window into a fascinating 17th century Japanese context. Every now and then, we will get a great movie such as A Royal Affair, a 2012 Danish historical drama set in the 18th century in Denmark and telling the remarkable story of royal physician Johann Friedrich Strunz, a mentally ill king Christian VII of Denmark and his wife Queen Carolyn Matilda of Great Britain. Of course, certain events are dramatized and fictionalized and romanticized, yet regardless, these movies with the right quality production and actors and script incentivize people to take a more profound interest in history or historical figures. It is rare that independent smaller studios will make such movies that oftentimes do not get much if any publicity, and they slowly develop in time a following because of the internet and word of mouth. Now, this is not to say that there aren't history movies that perform really well. We've had the example of Braveheart in the mid-90s. And of course, the striking exceptions from all of this seem to revolve around the 20th century and the World Wars, with a plethora of movies about Germany and the Second World War being released in the last 10 to 15 years. Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk and Joe Wright's Darkest Hour with Gary Oldman as Churchill, both 2017 movies, focused on World War II and events from that period, something still very ingrained in recent human memory, arguably the the world's worst catastrophe. Whether you're German, British, Italian, Indian, American, Canadian, Japanese, or Russian, people who are not necessarily cinephiles, you will eventually go and watch something that is related to the Second World War. Even more so if Christopher Nolan, one of the most recognized and acclaimed directors of our time, is at the helm of such a project. In an increasingly monopolistic and excruciatingly mercantilistic cinematic industry, just check the top 20 box offices from the last four years, it is difficult to see directors trying to embark on passion projects such as as Silence, the one that I've just mentioned, focused on historical individuals or events. We are lucky that sometimes independent studios will give brilliant writers and directors such as Armando Iannucci a chance to take a satirical historical approach to the events of the death of Stalin. After the resounding success of 2001 A Space Odyssey, a film completed in 1968, it was said that by Mid-1969, Stanley Kubrick already had a biographical script for a Napoleon movie focusing on a Frenchman's life, 
a 180-minute dramatized historical documentary about the rise and fall of someone who had redefined the 19th century Europe and to a certain extent the world. The script itself is available as public domain on Google Docs and I've provided a link in the description box below. The script and story itself will be covered in the next part of this episode, but for now, let us focus on the remarkable section containing the production notes at the end of the script. The movie would have taken around 150 days to shoot, plus minus 10. Most of the battles and exterior scenes would have been filmed in Yugoslavia with interior scenes shot in Italy. Interesting that nothing would have been filmed in France. Kubrick knew that in order to do justice to a character like Napoleon, he required a vast epic scene and scenes involving staggering numbers of extras, a great leading actor and a masterpiece of a soundtrack. Kubrick would also give us insight of how much a costumed extra used to cost in different countries at that time. Remember, this was 1969. It would be 1920 for an extra in England, $14.28 in Spain, $24 in Italy, and unsurprisingly, most expensive was $24.30 in France. It was remarkable that Kubrick wrote about a bid received from the Romanian government, ran at the time by Nicolae Ceausescu, who offered 30,000 extras at a cost of $2 per person, without costumes, that is. Which is even more interesting considering that at the time, Romanian filmmaker Sergiu Nicolaescu was making historical movies such as Daci that also required a large number of extras. So the opportunity was there. A similar deal was offered by the Yugoslavian government at a rate of $5 per extra. This is in page 150 of the script. Kubrick had an acute business-like approach in order to try and convince studios to undertake colossal projects such as this, trying to convince producers that those governments from Eastern Europe would be very eager to participate in a cinematic project involving large quantities of US dollars. He was aware that lavish decorations for sets would have cost between three and six million dollars at the time a huge sum. In regards to casting, Kubrick was gloriously refreshing, saying the following, quote, As was discussed in our first meetings about Napoleon, my intention is to use great actors and new faces, and more sensibly put emphasis on the power of the story, the spectacle of the film, and my own ability to make a film of more than routine interest. End quote. This can be found on page 152 of the script. One fault that I would find with Kubrick's approach was the fact that he wanted to use the same actor for a 27-year-old Napoleon when he took command of the armies in Italy and for a 45-year-old Napoleon at Waterloo. I shall return to this point in the follow-up episode in the next part. What was impressive for a movie that was never actually made was the amount of preparatory work underwent by Kubrick and his staff. This included a collection containing a picture file of approximately 15,000 Napoleonic subjects, also intensive research of military uniforms of all different nations involved, location research, photography, the fact that Professor Felix Markham's advisorship had almost been secured also of the legal rights of his Napoleon biography. The amount of detail was staggering, including the variation of lenses from film and photography. Stanley Kubrick had read the history, spoken to academics, and did outstanding logistical and technical research. Yet it may have not been the time for such an ambitious film to be released in the early 1970s. This brings us closer to the present, Steven Spielberg always said that he was a fan of Kubrick's script and the idea of a grandiose Napoleonic movie. In 2013, 
He announced his intention of collaborating with the Kubrick family in a project that in 2016 got a green light from HBO to be released as a miniseries with Kari Fukunaga of true detective fame as director. HBO, Spielberg, Fukunaga, working with a Kubrick original script. Most likely the series will be released well after 2020 more than half a century since Kubrick had drafted the script and plan. What will happen? How will the series be created and afterwards be perceived by the general public? It's very hard to tell. Yet there is hope, especially for historians and history enthusiasts, that Kubrick's obsession with historical context and detail will be imbued into a series made by a network that generally had made very decent historical drama series from Chernobyl to Deadwood to Rome. With the budgets, staff, writers, and overall quality of television that HBO usually produce, one can hope it will be a remarkable production in whatever form or shape it will be released, either as a miniseries or as an actual series. Welcome to the Wanderers History Podcast, and to the second part talking about Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon Project, the movie, arguably one of the largest and most impressive cinematic projects created in 1969, after I talked about the logistics and remarkable production plans in the previous episode. Before we begin, if you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to the channel to make sure you never miss any new history material from the podcast. Now, the 100 and 55 page script is available on Google Docs and I've provided a link in the description box below. I would like to restate that of course I do not own in any way the rights for this material. I'm just a fan both of history and Stanley Kubrick who is always fascinated by this script. After reading the whole script I have summarized the plot and will talk about the role of the narrator's view plot, transitions from scenes and periods, and much more. The first scene shows the early origins of Napoleon Bonaparte as a four-year-old boy and reads the following, quote, Interior bedroom, Corsica, night. A well-worn teddy bear is cradled in the arms of Napoleon, age four, who dreamily sucks his thumb, listening to a bedtime story told by his young mother, Letizia. His five-year-old brother, Joseph, is already asleep beside him. End quote. Here we have an introduction with a self-evident but meaningful message. An innocent four-year-old with a teddy bear who would end up becoming a man redefining European geopolitics. He would end empires and republics. He would subdue Italy, also the once powerful Holy Roman Empire. He would be a general who led battles after battles, leading to death matched maybe by the brutality of the Thirty Years' War in the previous centuries. Also, the theme of motherhood is very prevalent over here, as we have the narrator saying, quote, Napoleon was born in Ajaccio in Corsica on August 15th, 1769. He had not been a healthy baby, and his mother, Letizia, lavished him with care and devotion. In middle age, he would write about her from St. Helena. End quote. A very short voiceover from an adult Napoleon would say, quote, My mother has always loved me. She would do anything for me. End quote. After the main titles, we see a leap of five years to a nine-year-old Napoleon struggling with impoverished conditions during a freezing, still dark winter morning. He wakes up wanting to pour water, but couldn't because it was frozen in the pitcher. This happens at Brienne with the narrator explaining, quote, At the age of nine, Napoleon entered the Royal Military College at Brienne in France under a royal scholarship. For the next five and a half years, 
he would devote himself to preparation for his military career. These were harsh and cheerless years for the lonely, impoverished provincial among affluent French noble sons. End quote. Moving onwards, we have the narrator saying, quote, At the age of 16, he graduated as sub-lieutenant from the Royal Military School in Paris and was posted to the crack regiment de la Fere at Valence. End quote. Already from the very beginning, we see a very heavy storytelling perspective from a narrator giving the movie from the early starts a very strong documentary style feeling. We once more hear the narrator explain the early genesis of Napoleon's understanding of warfare, saying, quote, The practical professional training that Napoleon would receive for the next three years would give him a working knowledge of all arms and expose him to the advanced military ideas of Duteil, Bousset, and Guibert. End quote. We then move to another scene showing Napoleon's dedication to study in his room at Valence. It is filled with books, mostly of military subjects, but well stocked with poetry, history and philosophy. He is reading by the candlelight. Outside, we hear the sounds of reverie produced by less conscientious officers. Everything shifts to a state of mind, having both narrator and Napoleon himself as a voiceover saying, quote, his moods at this time were complex and varied, end quote, followed by a Napoleon voiceover saying, Life is a burden for me. Nothing gives me any pleasure. I only find sadness in everything around me. It is very difficult because the ways of those with whom I live, and probably always shall live, are as different from mine as moonlight is from sunlight, end quote. In the next scenes, we would see a, a very young Napoleon meeting a, a young girl called Lisette on a cold winter's night. They go to his hotel room and they talk, scene ending with Napoleon blowing up a candle in a freezing room. The plot gears up and we see a title screen saying 1789 Revolution. We see hundreds of revolutionary peasants gathering in the town square and Napoleon arrives with a small contingent of 25 troops and one drummer. Napoleon starts to show signs of his imperious authority, not being afraid to go alone in the crowd and ask for the arrest of one citizen called Varlak. It is a scene where tension slowly builds up with Napoleon saying, quote, Contrary to what you have been telling these good people, Monsieur Varlac, France is still in the hands of its proper authorities, and they have sent me here with a warrant for your arrest. You are charged with the murder of Monsieur de Bouchy and his son, and the burning of his chateau. End quote. Napoleon exudes authority and respect for order, and goes on saying, quote, you may save your philosophy for the magistrate, Monsieur Varlac. I am only a simple officer in the army, and to me, what you have done is called murder, and has always been called murder by honest men. End quote. After Varlac continues to procrastinate, Napoleon shows no more patience drawing his pistol and counting to five, and he ends up shooting him in the head with the scene ending by Napoleon saying, Quote, a confessed murderer has just been shot. Now, let all honest men return to their homes. End quote. And the scene would fade out. The action would move to the summer of 1793, with civil war sweeping through France, and the important naval base at Toulon falling into the hands of a royalist insurrection, which quickly handed over the port to a combined British and Spanish fleet. At Toulon, Napoleon, now a captain of the artillery, is part of the campaign. A scene with an animated map would follow showing Napoleon's different plan of conquering Toulon. After Toulon, the action moves 
once more to Paris, showing the political crisis brewing and escalating. Barat once more is shown with Napoleon, who is able to read the situation better by saying, quote, The numbers are not particularly relevant. You are not up against soldiers. This is a mob, and they will run as soon as things become sufficiently unpleasant. End quote. After showing the successful French Republican win at Toulon with help from Napoleon, Kubrick moves on towards a more personal aspect of Napoleon's private life, where he would meet Josephine, future wife, via her son becoming part of Napoleon's contingent, a 16-year-old named Eugène du Buhanet. Shortly, everything is led towards the marriage of Napoleon and Josephine in a small private civil ceremony in the mayor's office with half a dozen guests. From this point onwards, we see a bit of a divergence between Napoleon's personal and professional military life with the script reading, quote, the following excerpts from Napoleon's letters to Josephine will be read over the following scenes, which follow after the text of the letters. The visual will show Josephine's affair with Hippolyte Charles and Napoleon's life in camp and on the march. The letters are presented uninterrupted by the scene descriptions to preserve their flow. The script moves on and the nearly omnipresent narrator says about the Italian campaign, quote, Napoleon steps onto the stage as a figure of European importance. A dozen victories in as many months would be announced in dramatic and highly colored bulletins. The battles of the revolution had been so far mainly defensive. Now, there was revealed a new kind of offensive warfare, such as had not been seen in Europe for centuries. We then see a scene of the French taking control of a small Italian village of no more than a few hundred people, followed by a voiceover of Napoleon saying, quote, There is no man more cautious than I am when planning a campaign. I exaggerate all the dangers and all the disasters that might occur. I look quite serene to my staff, but I am like a woman in labor. Once I have made up my mind, everything is forgotten except what leads to success. End quote. This in turn is followed by Napoleon analyzing the battlefield in real time and a shooting occurring from a distance. We see in the script the following, the art of war is a simple art. Everything is in the execution. There is nothing vague in it. It is all common sense. Theory does not enter into it. The simplest moves are always the best. It all leads to a clear victory of the French in this instance over the Austrians. This is followed by a triumphal entrance to Milan, making Napoleon irreplaceable because of his successes, at the same time making the directory weaker and weaker against his ascendancy. It is in this instance where Kubrick shows us the first signs of grandeur and authority similar to mighty Roman generals. And Napoleon says, quote, From that moment on, I foresaw what I might be. Already I felt the earth flee beneath me, as I were being carried away up to the sky. After the Italian campaign, the script takes us to Egypt, and the narrator sets out the context, location, and time, saying, quote, On July 2nd, 1798, Napoleon arrived in Egypt with an army of 40,000 men and a romantic dream of conquest following Alexander's march into India. The Directory had been quick to approve his plan for attacking England indirectly through their eastern empire rather than by invasion of Britain, and they breathed a sigh of relief to have their unemployed conqueror off the doorstep." End quote. 
Once more, we have an association of Napoleon with one of the greatest generals of the ancient world, being Alexander. The first scenes would see Napoleon near the Sphinx, and then by the pyramids. The script reads, quote, Napoleon and the scientists inspect a mummy brought out into the sunlight after thousands of years. A mood of somber reflection pervades the scene. End quote. This is followed by a very short scene at a wall of hieroglyphs. The script reads, quote, A young drummer boy scribbles long live the Republic on the face of some hieroglyphic writing. Several other soldiers closely scrutinize the ancient writing. End quote. Everything moves to the desert warfare against the Mamelukes. Most French troops seem to be intimidated and afraid of the unusual surroundings, but not Napoleon. The script reads, quote, Napoleon, pleased with the way things are going, rides over to the groups of scientists to cheer them up. He has to shout to be heard. End quote. Napoleon shouts, Good afternoon, gentlemen. I hope you're enjoying this unusual spectacle. One cannot see this in Paris for any price. The scientists are too frightened to be amused. Napoleon shows a remarkable ability of reading the tide of the battle, even in the desert, saying that at that rate, the Mamelukes would be losing 50 of their soldiers to just one French. An artist, meanwhile, is making sketches of the battles with Napoleon being very impressed and asking if he could have them, no doubt visual mementos of his early success in Egypt. Everything is followed by a revelation at the captured mansion of Murad Bey, where Junot tells Napoleon about Josephine and Charles. The scene is very tense, with bouts of fury from Napoleon. Here it is that we see a parallel of bad news in both Napoleon's private life, finding out about the adulterous relationship of his wife, but also his professional life, because everything is interrupted with Napoleon receiving a letter of highest importance for his eyes only saying, quote, Nelson has engaged Brie off Aboukir. Brie is dead and we have lost 11 ships, end of quote. This, of course, would be the outcome of the Battle of Nile, also known as the Battle of Aboukir Bay. Nelson and the British fleet would decisively defeat the French and Napoleon would have to come back to France. That is where the whole action moves fairly abruptly to a French town and the narrator saying, quote, On October 9th, 1799, Napoleon, with only a small entourage, arrived at the port of Fréjus in France after a journey of six weeks in which he evaded a large British fleet the news of his arrival threw France into a delirium of joy. His return was seen as a kind of deliverance by a nation in the grip of economic chaos, near anarchy and the threat of invasion. We would see very tense scenes between Napoleon and the Directorate at the interior chambers of the Directory in Paris, daytime. The script reads, quote, A large room in Luxembourg Palace. Napoleon is seated before the five directors, Barat, Sillet, Moulin, Goyer, and Roger Ducot, who are dressed in their pompous official costumes with three-foot hats and feathered plums. Present also are Talleyrand, Fouche, Joseph, Lucien, and a several dozen important officials. A dialogue ensues between Napoleon and Gohier. Napoleon says, Nelson's victory at Aboukir quite effectively finished the strategic purpose of the campaign, and with the loss of all our principal fighting ships, the army was marooned in Egypt, and our communications with the continent were severed. The only options remaining to me were to develop the occupation of Egypt, to maintain the morale of my army, and to respond to the threats being created by the English, and very soon the Turks. This was accomplished, culminating in my final victory against the Turks, when they attempted a landing at Aboukir. Gohier replies, I wonder if you would 
care to tell us, General Bonaparte, why, so soon after this admirable victory, you decided to abandon your army and return to France? Napoleon says, Citizen Goyer, my army was not abandoned. It was left in a very strong position and in the capable hands of General Kleber. To which it is replied, Of course, General Bonaparte, an unfortunate choice of words. Only the enemies of your glory, whom we shall regard as our own, would wish to give adverse interpretation to the honorable motives of patriotism, which I am sure induced you to leave your colors. Please continue. Napoleon smiles coldly and says, After the defeat of the Turks, a negotiation to arrange the exchange of prisoners took place aboard Sir Sidney Smith's flagship. At the end of the first meeting, Sir Sidney gave me my chief negotiator, General Marmont, several German newspapers, a fairly recent date. There's a pause that follows, and Napoleon resumes by saying, Now you must bear in mind that for more than a year I had received no news at all from Europe, not a newspaper or a single mail packet. Perhaps you can imagine my state of mind when I read of the serious defeats that had been inflicted upon France during my absence. The loss of Italy, the Anglo-Russian army's occupation of Holland, the imminent invasion of France herself. After several days of deliberation, it seemed clear to me that it was my duty to risk the English blockade and, with a, sm a few small ships, attempt to return to serve my country in any way that might be possible. The narration starts over Napoleon's dialogue, which fades under. The narrator says, The government of the directory was bankrupt, and its presses ran all night printing the money it would spend the next day. Two of its five members, Sillet and Ro Roger Ducot, who had the support of the moderate political factions, were preparing to seize power. They would welcome the inclusion of Napoleon, who would secure the support of the army, and who was now the most popular figure in France. The next scenes concern Napoleon's personal life once more, deciding what course of action to take with Josephine. The script reads, quote, Napoleon and Josephine in bed. The mood is postcoital depression for Napoleon. Submission and apprehension for Josephine. There is a long silence before anyone speaks, end quote. They eventually come to reconciliation with Napoleon promising to never leave her after a long conversation. With this personal interior conflict in Napoleon's life temporarily solved, the scene moves to a new title, which reads Coup d'etat. Slowly but surely we see Napoleon's rise to ultimate power as he orchestrated a coup in November 1799 and became first consul of the Republic with the script reading The cry is picked up of dictator, tyrant and outlaw. The script continues, saying, A scuffle breaks out and Napoleon is knocked to the ground and viciously kicked. His guards manage to club their way into the melee and drag him out of the orangery. Among the soldiers, Napoleon, his face bloody, mounts a horse and rides through his men. The troops are confused by his appearance, but give him a cheer as he passes by. After a tense exchange, the narrator concludes by saying, At the age of 30, Napoleon would become first consul and head of the executive for a period of 10 years. The two other consuls would become merely figureheads. End quote. Naturally, the script now leads to the transition to the French Empire, illustrated by the title just saying that. The narrator says, quote, in the five years that followed, Napoleon gave proof of his brilliant legislative, administrative, and organizational powers. He created effective 
and enduring institutions of government, revitalized the economy, negotiated a concordat with the Pope, thus ending the religious rebellion in the Vendée, reconciled the bitterness between the right and left by opening all careers to talent and bringing into his government the best minds of the aristocracy and the ablest survivors of the revolution. Napoleon had secured the main social and material gains of the revolution, destroying privileged orders and modernizing the state. In exchange for this, he would now be given power far more absolute than any Bourbon monarch. This would be illustrated by the coronation day at Notre Dame Cathedral. At the moment when the Pope reaches for the crown of Charlemagne to take it from the altar, Napoleon takes it and with his own hands places it on its own head. Napoleon looks with an air of pride and satisfaction at Josephine as she advances towards him at the altar and when she kneels down, tears fall upon her clasped hands, raised to heaven or rather to Napoleon. And with this triumphant scene, we end the first half of Stanley Kubrick's Napoleonic script. In the next episode, we'll talk about the other half, which included Kubrick's vision on events at Austerlitz, the Russian campaign and subsequent retreat, followed by his demise at Waterloo and his exile. After the coronation scene, the script would take us to a new scene finding Emperor Napoleon at an exquisite dinner, dessert being served at the time, and Napoleon offering his opinion on the French Revolution. Napoleon would say, quote, The revolution failed because the foundation of its political philosophy was in error. Its central dogma was the transference of original sin from man to society. It had the rosy vision that by nature man is good and that he is only corrupted by an incorrectly organized society. Destroy the offending social institutions. Tinker with the machine a bit. And you have utopia. Presto. Natural man back in all his goodness. End quote. Laughter echoes at the table. And Napoleon continues, quote, It's a very attractive idea, but it simply isn't true. They had the whole thing backwards. Society is corrupt because man is corrupt, because he is weak, selfish, hypocritical, and greedy. And he is not made this way by society. He is born this way. You can see it even in the youngest children. It's no good trying to build a better society on false assumptions. Authority's main job is to keep man from being at his worst and thus make life tolerable for the greater number of people. To this, Monsieur Triot replies, quote, Your Majesty, you certainly have a very pessimistic view of human nature. Napoleon, in turn, replies, quote, My dear Monsieur Triot, I'm not paid for finding it better. End of quote. Here we have a concise philosophical view of how Emperor Napoleon saw the world, the corrupt nature of man, and what the role of the state was in keeping the worst of man at bay with authority in order to preserve and for the betterment of society. It is followed by a cold conversation between Napoleon and a very jealous Josephine, only for them to reconcile. Everything gears up towards the war with Napoleon's old enemy. The narrator steps in and sets the scene. And the script reads, quote, Since the year 1069, France and England had been at war for a total of 152 years. And from 1338, the kings of England also called themselves the kings of France until Napoleon obliged them to drop this title at the time of the short-lived peace treaty of Amiens in 1802. In the following year, England again declared war on France and the conflict between the British and French imperialism for maritime supremacy and world power would now be fought to a finish. 
end quote. The narrator would continue, saying that Napoleon devised a plan to lure the British fleet into a wild goose chase to the West Indies, leaving the channel unprotected long enough for the French to ferry their army safely across. But the scheme was poorly executed and eventually led to the disastrous naval defeat at Trafalgar. However, everything transitions to a milestone of 19th century European military history at Austerlitz, with the script reading, quote, A cold, blustery day. A large fire has been built at the base of a steep-sided gully. French cavalry vedettes are posted at the top of the hill. A party of 50 Austrian hussars escorting three imperial carriages comes to a halt. Drummers and trumpeters sound a salute. Napoleon helps the defeated Emperor Francis of Austria from his carriage, embracing him with cordiality. This is the first meeting between Napoleon and an important European monarch. End quote. This segment about Austerlitz represents a combination of dialogue and narration, the narrator stepping in often and giving an update on the state of events as we progress along in the movie. For example, the narrator says, quote, having ruined the Austro-Russian alliance by her neutrality, Prussia proceeded in the following year to commit suicide by taking on Napoleon single-handed. Followed by the narrator saying again, Prussia would make the same strategic error that Austria made in the previous year, and she would overconfidently rush forward to meet the French alone, without waiting for their Russian allies. In seven days of fighting, the Prussian army would be virtually destroyed. Everything moves towards the 1807 Treaty of Tilsit, and we see the interior of the Tilsit Salon during the day. Napoleon and Tsar Alexander I leaning on their elbows on a large map of the world, spread out on a table. The narrator proceeds and says, quote, Alexander had come to treat as a fallen enemy. There would be not territorial demands, no reparations, only an intoxicating proposal to divide the world between them. Very interesting dialogue exchanges take place between Napoleon and Alexander, and then Napoleon, sitting in a steaming bathtub, with Talleyrand going over clauses of the Treaty of Tilsit, at times in disbelief in what terms were agreed. They then talk about England, its reliance on Austria for any hopes of sustained war against the French, and the role of the Russians in all of this. The chapter ends on fanfare at the Niemen ri River, Napoleon hugging Alexander, telling him always to deal with Napoleon directly, so as advisors and ministers to never muddy the waters. The scene fades out, and we get a new chapter title called The Fall, which begins with Napoleon and Josephine in the imperial throne room, Napoleon stating that he needed an heir to continue his legacy, and he was unable to be provided one by Josephine who's sobbing while reading a divorce statement. Napoleon is described as being pale and shaken, an indicator of what is to come. The narrator tells us, quote, On the day after the divorce, Napoleon drove to Malmaison to visit with Josephine, and this visit was to set a pattern for all those to come. They were always announced in advance, there was something ceremonious and constrained about them, and they always left Josephine in a state of deep depression. End quote. We then get information of the proxy wedding of Marie Louise and Napoleon in Vienna. The Archduke Charles stands in for the absent Napoleon. Intimate scenes and conversations are shown between Napoleon and Marie Louise. Fast forwarding, then we see Napoleon holding his son, the infant king of Rome, to the cheering multitude below. Standing beside him are Marie-Louis, his mother, and the entourage. The plot once more refocuses on Russia 
and the narrator indicating the geopolitical situation at the time. The script reads, quote, By 1810, relations between France and Russia were wearing thin. The terms Russia ag had agreed to at Tilsit three years earlier were proving to be unrealistic and ruinous to her. All of this would set the scene for Napoleon's Russian campaign. The script reading, Maps and books are everywhere. Napoleon is on his hands and knees, creeping around on a huge map of Russia. The narrator says that a showdown with Russia now is inevitable. It shows Napoleon determined to strike down the Russian army and go for Moscow. The narrator says, quote, With his army of 400,000 men in concealed bivouacs on a 10-mile front in the forests, bordering the banks of the Vistula River, Napoleon conducted a last-minute personal reconnaissance, disguised in the uniform of a Polish lancer, end quote. There is then a metaphoric scene of Napoleon's horse stumbling, Napoleon himself falling. He lightens the mood by making a joke and saying, quote, Well, this is an ill omen, indeed. Caesar would probably turn back, end quote. Foreshadowing plays a key role here, knowing in hindsight the result of the Russian campaign from Napoleon. The horse symbolizes his army, which stumbles, with Napoleon the Emperor falling, only for him to eventually get up. The narrator as well seems concerned, saying, quote, The campaign of 1812 was the first time in which Napoleon had marked superiority of numbers, but in accumulating such a mass of uneven quality, he would defeat his object, which was to bring about another Austerlitz or Friedland. End quote. The narrator goes on to say that Alexander ordered his army to withdraw, blow up bridges, raise villages, and anything of use for the French army. Despite constant movement, there were fierce skirmishes between the French advance guard and the Russian rear one. The narrator initially paints a grim pessimistic image for the Russians, saying, As Napoleon approached Moscow, at the court of St. Petersburg, was in despair, and the Tsar, his resolve shaken, was ready to sue for peace. Now the inter intervention of one man, Count Fyodor Vasilievich Rostopchin, the governor of Moscow, would have a decisive effect on the course of history. He delivers a prophetic speech. Napoleon does indeed take Moscow, only for it to be engulfed in fire shortly afterwards. There's a lengthy dialogue shown between Tsar Alexander and General Kutuzov, more prudent than Rostopchin. Kutuzov predicts Napoleon's withdrawal to Poland. In the meantime, back at the Kremlin balcony during the day, the script reads that it is a fine fall day. Napoleon and a small entourage are having lunch outside on a balcony overlooking Moscow. The narrator proceeds to say, quote, Day after day, a fine autumn weather was allowed to slip away while Napoleon waited for the word from Alexander, which would never come. The weather was so fine and the temperature so mild that it seemed as if even the season was conspiring to deceive Napoleon. End quote. Furthermore, the narrator says, quote, Napoleon was extremely superstitious and retained a mystical belief in his partnership with fate, a sense that he could only do so much and that events must somehow complete the decision. And so it would be in Moscow where, without confidence and full of apprehension, he would cheerlessly pursue his destiny, unaware that fortune, which had so often smiled upon him, had now abandoned his cause just when he required miracles of her. Narrator proceeds again and says, It was not only until October 20th that Napoleon withdrew the Grand Army from Moscow to begin their thousand-mile march into oblivion. End quote. Kubrick would move on to show that Napoleon 
had waited far too long and the brutal retreat was poignantly described by the narrator and filmography, a spoken and visual explanation of technicalities required to retreat such a large army. The narrator says, quote, But by November 5th, the temperature was down to minus 30 degrees of frost and 30,000 French horses were dead. They were not bred to endure such cold and not being properly shot for ice had no chance to survive in these conditions. End of quote. The Russian campaign was an unmitigated disaster that tore mo most of his army. The narrator moves fast forwards to 1814 saying, quote, On January 1st, 1814, France itself was invaded. Now, with a small army of raw recruits, Napoleon would have to face the powerful combination of England, Russia, Prussia and Austria operating against him together for the first time. The balance of numbers was tilted irretrievably against him. In a following voiceover, Napoleon says, A year ago, the whole of Europe was marching alongside of us. Today, the whole of Europe is marching against us. The Battle of Paris in 1814 is shown leading to the first fall of Napoleon, with the narrator concluding, In defeat, Napoleon would be punished by the kings of Europe according to a standard which they would not have applied to each other. He might marry the niece of Marie Antoinette and call himself an emperor, but that did not make him one. The next chapter would be entitled Elba, and it would say, the Treaty of Fontainebleau on April 11th, 1814, signed by his allies and Napoleon in return for his ab abdication from the throne of France, gave him the token sovereignty of the tiny island of Elba with the title of emperor, a yearly income of 2 million francs and an army of 700 with a navy of free ships. But in 10 months time, even this tiny stake would be sufficient capital to bring this most reckless of all gambles back into the game for a final breathtaking spin of the wheel. End quote. The script lets us know that Napoleon finds out about the death of Josephine, which occurred on the 29th of May, 1814, for a conversation with Bertrand. The narrator goes on to say, quote, when Louis XVIII Returned to Paris in 1814, he was an, as unknown in France as an Egyptian pharaoh. Marked by clumsiness and disdain, he quickly proved that the Bourbon dynasty had learned nothing and forgotten nothing. People said that he did not return to the throne of his ancestors, but simply ascended to the throne of Bonaparte. By 1815, the army and the people were ready to rise against him and welcome the return of Napoleon. Napoleon set sail from Elba on February 26, 1815, with his small force of 700 soldiers, while the governor of the island, Sir Neil Campbell, was away in Florence. He put his soldiers to work, writing out his proclamations in longhand. With Napoleon being restored, the movie moves towards Waterloo. We are informed by the script that, quote, on the morning of June 18th, Napoleon, with 74,000 men, faced Wellington with 67,000 on a battlefield near the village of Mount Saint-Jean, 10 miles south of Brussels. Confident that the Prussians were out of action or contained by Grouchy's pursuing cavalry, Napoleon's only fear was that Wellington would retreat. End quote. We get a very detailed account of the battle with many animated maps. Napoleon would be defeated once more and removed from France as shown in the last chapter or title called Saint Helena. The last chapter starts with an exterior of a deck ship during the day. The script reads, quote, Napoleon on the deck of the Northumberland looking at the cliffs of Saint Helena. He is depressed by the mass of bare volcanic granite rising steepingly out of the sea, barely 28 miles in circumference, end quote. 
The script would give details of his last years, his illness, and ultimately his death, with the narrator saying, quote, Napoleon died on May 5th, 1821. Hudson Lowe insisted the inscription on the tomb should read Napoleon Bonaparte. In the end, it was left nameless, end quote. The movie ends with a scene with an aging Letizia, mother of Napoleon, who would pass away in February 1836. The script reads and takes us to the interior of Letizia's bedroom in Rome during the day. Quote, his mother, dressed in black, sits alone, a study of gloom and lament. The shutters are closed and the semi-darkness of the room is broken by bright slivers of sunlight. The camera moves slowly away from Letizia to an opened portmanteau. It is filled with very old children's things, faded toys, torn picture books, wooden soldiers, and the teddy bear Napoleon slept with as a child. And that is how the scene and the whole movie fades out. Here we get a very sad and one can say tragic ending, closing with the opening scene, one can say, where we saw Napoleon as a child, innocent, a child who became one of history's most remarkable generals, leaders, a figure so deeply ingrained in French and European history. It's remarkable how much Stanley Kubrick was able to condense in one movie, albeit three hours long, covering Napoleon's entire life, personal military career, his origins, the rise and fall and demise. We are lucky to have this script available, showing us what Stanley Kubrick wanted to do with this cinematic project, hopefully in the form of a series or a series of movies, we will be able to see it translated to the small screens or large screens. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wanderer's History Podcast about the script, plot, and story of Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon movie. Please consider dropping a like and hitting the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Every single bit helps. Until then, and the next time, all the best. Bye.